is a tenured assistant professor of history at Tuskegee University. She received her BBA from Howard University, her MBA from Atlanta University, and her MA and PhD degrees in, Amer in African American Studies from Temple University. As a historian for the Tuskegee Airmen Oral History Project, she interviewed over 250 airmen. She has served as an investigator for an oral history project on historic Brattonsville, the York County, South Carolina plantation on which her ancestors, Green and Melinda Bratton, were enslaved. Her upcoming book, I Am the Forever, chronicles their lives from enslavement to being the first freedman to own land in the county. Dr. Bratton is an avid traveler who has visited 50 states, six continents, and such fascinating places as North Korea and Cuba. In 2018, she traveled to five continents in five weeks. Her goal is to retire on a fabulous beach. And so tonight we're happy to welcome Dr. Lisa Bratton. Thank you very much um, uh, for organizing this event. And I am very happy to be here and to share this very important history with you. So um, right now I'm gonna share my screen and we can go on and get started. <clears throat> so I wanna start by talking about the very beginning of the Tuskegee Airmen. And so this really happened actually long before uh, even uh, after, right after World War I, but I want to talk about the Army War College. So the Army War College, very similar to what we know as the Pentagon, um, or, you know, it's the um, arm of the uh, federal government that advised the, um, the Army. So, you know, in terms of war strategies, um, this, the Army War College, uh, history professionals and military professionals, and you can get an idea of who... Um, uh, what type of people, all white males, were uh, part of the Army War College. So in 1925, the Army War College put together a report, and it was called The Use of Negro Manpower in War. So this is after World War I, and the question that they were considering was, is it possible to use Negroes in war? Now, mind you, African Americans have served in every war this country has had, since the very beginning. So um, I'm not, I, maybe they missed that history lesson, but um, so they decided to try to find out the best way or if it was even possible, quote unquote possible to use Negroes in war. And this was the report that came out in 1925. So this is some of the excerpts from the 1925 War College report. The Negro has no leaders in industrial or commercial life. The Negro takes no part in government and the Negro is inherently weak in character. And these are statements that I've taken verbatim from the report. So I decided to take a look at those and found that, in fact, there are, and we all know that these statements are not true, but looking even at around the time that this, even around the time and before the time that this War College report was put out, you have an example of Booker T. Washington, who was the first president of my university, Tuskegee University, also the founder of National Negro Business League, which in fact is still around today, and also the founder of National Negro Health Week. And uh, Booker T. Washington in his day was considered the most important Negro in America. Um, and then because this is uh, Women's History Month, and because I always like to talk about women, even when it's not Women's History Month, um, but Maggie Lena Walker was the first woman to own a bank in the United States. And her bank, when so many banks were failing during the Depression years, her bank actually survived that. And if you are ever in um, Richmond, Virginia, her home is still standing. And it's a really interesting place in history. I mean, a, a historic site to visit because she had uh, an elevator in her home as she um, as she grew older, she began to have some uh, movement challenges, some mobility challenges. And so she built an elevator in her home in the 1930s. Um, and I mean, do you know a person with an elevator in their home today? I don't. So um, just very, um, just, but if you're ever in uh, 
in uh, Richmond. It's Worst Singer House. And of course, if you're ever in Tuskegee, since I mentioned her home, Booker T. Washington's home is also still standing on the campus of Tuskegee University. And um, he was the first person to have electricity in the state of Alabama, the first person, black or white, to have electricity in his home. So look at the statement, the Negro takes no part in government. One of my favorite people in um, history is Robert Smalls, who commandeered a Confederate ship and sailed and put and got his family on it and sailed it from Confederate waters to Union waters. So he had grown up in Beaufort, South Carolina. He lived around um, the, uh, the, the ocean. And so he was it was uh, observed what are the signals when you're what signals the Confederate ships use, and so he, that was how he was able to free himself and his family on the sh uh, by sailing them across from uh, the Confederate side to the Union side. And he was a state senator, U.S. congressperson, founder of a school, editor of a newspaper, and um, just just one of my favorite people in history. And also um, the first black woman to elected to a state legislator in West Virginia, Minnie Buckingham Harper. The Negro is inherently weak in character. So I just put a picture up of uh, pictures up of some individuals who you know, um, Dr. King, uh, Shirley Chisholm, Malcolm X, um, Ida B. Wells, Rosa Parks, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. And this gentleman is my great, great grandfather who was also a person um, of integrity who became the first landowner, the first freedman to purchase land in York County, and then Harriet Tubman and Maya Angelou. And then I have some of the, uh, maybe some lesser known facts about these individuals that Dr. King led the Montgomery bus boycott when he was 26. Um, Shirley Chisholm, unbought and unbossed, that was her slogan when she ran for president in 1972. Um, and then sometimes we also hear about Malcolm X and, you know, they say, oh, Malcolm X was violent. I have not heard of a single act of violence that uh, Malcolm X was, was responsible for, but he did advocate self-defense. Um, Ida B. Wells Barnett founded a school and was a very, very outspoken advocate against lynching. Rosa Parks, and, you know, we see, hear about Rosa Parks and say, oh, her feet were tired and she sat down on the bus. And But I heard from her own mouth at that, I saw her several years ago at the King Center in Atlanta. And she said, please stop saying that I was tired. I was not, my feet were not tired. So we really need to get rid of that little myth in history. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer, the founder of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, who is known for the slogan, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Um, I mentioned my great, great grandfather and then Harriet Tubman, who probably is one of the bravest people I can think of. After freeing herself, she went back several times. And then she was such a, a person of service that she founded a home for the aged in Auburn, New York. And if you're ever in that area, I'm a big um, fan, <clears throat> excuse me, fan of historic sites. And I just went to her home uh, to visit her home uh, for my birthday in November. Um, and then Maya Angelou, um, who, was, who lived an entire life of activism, even from 1944 to 2014, her entire life was spent in activism. So when we look at some of these quotes from the Army War College report, we know that they're not true, but I just wanted to give some examples. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. Here are a few more um, quotes from the War College report. And I'm talking so much about this because this is the environment in which the Tuskegee Airmen were born um, with, the, with the federal government saying the Negro is has failed in war. He's sub naturally subservient. He's um, a, a, of inferior mental capacity to white to the white man. And so this is the this is the environment that we're dealing with in 1925 and in the 1930s when the when the Tuskegee Airmen experience uh, began. But I'm going to tell you about that too. So into this environment are the Tuskegee Airmen. So before I get to that, I have to really kind of set the stage 
for um, for this history. And I didn't know who would be here. I didn't know if there would be children here. So I apologize if I'm giving a lot of information that people already know, but because um, I didn't know who would be here. But sometimes it's good just to hear it repeated. So I have three people on this screen. Um, George, Dr. George Washington Carver, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Roosevelt, and Eleanor Roosevelt. So I love a good quiz. So what do these three people have in common? And if you think for a second, if you can't get the answer, that's okay, because I'm going to give you a hint. All right, any guesses? If not, that's okay. All right. So this is a photo of George Washington Carver in his laboratory at Tuskegee University. Dr. Carver was work, as you know, um, I, I said that the hint was FDR's wheelchair because um, FDR suffered from polio as even from, a, from childhood, he suffered from polio and he used a wheelchair for mobility. So Dr. Carver was working on a polio cure at Tuskegee University. So, Eleanor Roosevelt came to Tuskegee University to talk to George Washington Carver about the polio cure. So while she was there, she looked up in the sky and there were just, there were planes flying. And she's, and you know, so we have to remember too, like we see a plane now, it's really not that big a deal. You might see it and not even stop your conversation with a friend. But um, in this day, when you saw a plane in the air in the 1940s, early 1940s, it was a big deal. And so she saw these planes and she said, well, what, what is that? What's going on? And the secrets that other people said to her that were with her said, oh, that's a, uh, we're training pilots on, on Tuskegee's campus, we're training pilots. She said, well, I didn't think black people could fly airplanes. Well, that's not really a racist statement coming from her. That's based on if she knew anything about the War College Report or maybe um, had heard or that was just kind of the, the uh, understanding or the popular understanding that black people couldn't fly planes. So she said, I wanna take a ride with one of the pilots. And the Secret Service just had a fit. So, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that. They tried to find a telephone and got her husband on the phone and tried to get him to stop her. He said, I can't stop her. She wants to go, she's gonna go. So up she went with Chief Anderson. Um, if you watch any Tuskegee Airmen movies, they often say, that she went up in the air with a pilot. That's uh, with one of the Tuskegee Airmen uh, pilots who were training. That's not true. Uh, this is Chief Anderson, and he was a an instructor. An interesting fact about him: he um, wanted to learn how to fly, and no white pilots would teach him how to fly. So he saved his money. He bought an airplane, and he taught himself how to fly, which I think is just absolutely amazing. I couldn't even teach myself how to drive. Can you teach myself how to ride a bike? But he got the airplane, taught himself how to how to fly, which I think is amazing. The gentleman on the left, unfortunately, um, I don't know his name. I wish I did, because um, he's a part of this iconic piece of history. So um, in the 1940s, the US government had two militaries. So top to bottom, they had a black military, uh, Army Air Corps, the Army, and the Air Force were one unit at the time. So it was called the Army Air Corps. So the, from top to bottom, uh, from, the, from the commander on down, there was a black Air Force. From the commander on down, there was a white Air Force. And so um, the airmen, when they were training for pilots, uh, training to be pilots, they knew they could not fail. They knew that there was so much history riding on them. Some of them knew it. Now remember they're young men, they're in their 20s, early 20s. So some of them knew, had an idea about the history, but it was really their commander who you see on the right, whose father is uh, Bill Davis Jr., who's receiving his wings. Um, it was really on him. He was a little older than, uh, the, than the majority of the Tuskegee Airmen, very much a military man because he grew up with his father. You see, his father was also a general. And um, so growing up in that household, I'm sure he grew up with a with a military style. I had a military style upbringing. So um, the Tuskegee Airmen destroyed the myths that we saw from the 1925 War College Report. 
and their success led to the desegregation of the military. So the military was actually the first organization, large scale organization to be desegregated. And that was in 1948. And in part, I believe, because of the success of the Tuskegee Airmen. So the other types of, of, of desegregation that we know the legally, anyway, um, in schools that wasn't until 1954, um, in federal employment, uh, they had it, and there was the federal government, uh, in terms of the workforce, was deseg or desegregated, but resegregated by Woodrow Wilson. Um, and then housing, which we know in a lot of places is still segregated. But in terms of the legal desegregation, um, the military was the first, and that was in part because of the success of the Tuskegee Airmen. So I want to talk about how the Tuskegee Airmen got started. And I love this picture. I've kind of been building up to it all along, but I love this picture because this is George S. Spanky Roberts, who was um, the commander of the 332nd Fighter Squadron after B.O. Davis. And this is his actual great-great-grandson, Ziggy Spencer Roberts. And I got this picture. His daughters are good friends of mine. And so um, I just thought this would be kind of a nice way to talk about how the Tuskegee Airmen themselves as a unit got started. So in the 1930s, as I mentioned, um, aviation was very new. It was kind of like now if you meet an astronaut, you know, you want to take a picture with him or her. Um, and it's kind of a big deal if you meet an astronaut. That's kind of how it was uh, in the 1930s as it was with pilots. So the United States government started the civilian pilot training program to teach civilians, regular people, how to fly, but it was only open to whites. And so Dale, uh, Dale White and Chauncey Spencer, this is Chauncey Spencer right here. I'm moving my cursor over him. Um, and I did get a chance to interview Chauncey Spencer and I just wanted to meet him, but he had already been interviewed by another one of the historians. But I was reading a book about, um, called Otabanga, Pygmy in the Zoo. And it was about this young man who they had, um, a, 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 a circus promoter had kidnapped him from Africa and took him around to the zoos in Europe and in the United States as a, I don't know, as an oddity, but he was an African person. And um, so he was in the zoo. As it turns out, Chauncey Spencer's mother rescued this young man from the zoo. So I was reading about that and I said, well, I even though he's already been interviewed, I have to go interview him again because I have to find out all about Otabanga. But that was kind of an excuse. Yeah, that was an excuse because I just wanted to meet him. So I um, went, to, flew to um, Lynchburg, Virginia, where he lived and spent a delightful afternoon with him and his wife. So Mr. Spencer, when I met him, was already in his probably mid to late 90s when I met him. But um, it was, and that was just an absolute pleasure for me, uh, very much an honor to have met him. So he uh, and Dale White fly to Washington, D.C. to meet with congressional officials and to talk to them about adding the, um, the civilian pilot training program, making that program open to African-Americans. So they flew in their own plane. And that's a, 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 the plane that's shown here is an example of the plane that they use. It's not their exact plane. Um, but they left Chicago on May 9th, 1939 and flew to Washington. And they were successful. So there are actually six universities that had the pilot training program. Um, Hampton, Howard, Del Delaware State, West Virginia State, and North Carolina A&T. Those are five. And then there's one more, Tuskegee University. So Tuskegee also had the civilian pilot training program. So in those, at those six universities, African-Americans could learn to fly in the uh, early 1940s. So here's another quiz. So the, um, so um, I'm, get, I'm telling, I'm showing you those, uh, all six of the um, HBCUs that had the civilian pilot training program. So as the war began to heat up in Europe and it was possible that the United States might become involved, 
they decided to uh, build a military base to train military pilots because the civilian pilot training program is training pilots for civilian activity. But the, uh, they decided to build a Army Air Corps base that would train military pilots. So out of the six HBCUs, they chose Tuskegee to build the uh, military base. Now, why do you think that was? Anybody? No guesses? I put a hint up here, I put the map, and that's a hint. No guesses at all? Oh, is it, oh, this is a chat, location. Is that is that the answer for this, location? Okay. Um, Yes, location. Tell us about that. I'd like to hear from you all. No? So whoever posted for location, put the answer location, that's true. But would you, uh, tell us about why you said that answer. It's correct, but why did you say that answer? No takers? Oh, okay, okay. All right, so it is location. So two, two reasons why Tuskegee was chosen. The first is that um, location is correct. It's the weather, the weather. So when you look at Washington, D.C. and um, Virginia, places like that where it snows, you can't fly all year round. But in Alabama, pretty much you can fly all year round. And the second reason is that Tuskegee was located in the South. And they felt that they could keep the Negro boys in line in terms of segregation and in terms of making sure that they didn't get uh, too uppity, right? You know these terms I'm using. So, um, and that's another reason, because now remember, being a pilot is like being an astronaut. And so for an African-American man to be elevated to the, to the uh, importance of an astronaut today uh, or a pilot in the 40s, they just, had, they just wanted to be sure that they could um, make sure that these men did not get too big for their britches, as my mother would say. So those are the two reasons. Okay, so I did want to also, um, before we go on to continue to talk about the airmen, I did want to mention that there were women in all aspects of these experiences. And so there were women officers, the nurses who trained them, I'm going to talk a little bit about them later, were, um, were, were a, a major part of this experience. The, women Air, the Women's Air Corps, WAC or WAX, you may have heard that term before. Um, and then there were groups of women who sorted the mail. Now, just think about it. If you're overseas, you, of course, you don't have internet, you don't have a cell phone. Your only line of communication to your family is through letters. And so um, I'm sure millions of letters came through to the men and women who were serving overseas. And uh, there was a large contingent of African-American women who were responsible for sorting the mail. Um, a couple of women that you may have heard of, some early aviators, um, Bessie Coleman and Willa Brown. Bessie Coleman being the first African-American woman to earn a pilot's license. No one would teach her in the United States. So she went to France and that's where she received her license. And then Willa Brown was the first African-American woman to earn a pilot li pilot's license in the United States. Now, one more quiz. All right, someone's, a, someone's gonna have to turn off their, I mean, turn their mic on and um, for this question. All right, so this is Mildred and Eugene Carter.
in a minute, there's Mildred and Eugene Carter. Let me get them up. Oh, I guess I have to do this. Okay. Mildred and Eugene Carter, married couple. Who got their pilot's license first? They're both trained pilots. Who got their pilot's license first? His wife. Yes, ding, 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 ding. Correct, correct, correct. So um, Mrs. Carter was a part of the civilian pilot training program. And she got her license in 1941. And Mr. Carter, Gene Carter, was um, part of the military. And so he got his pilot's license a year later in 1942. So I mentioned earlier about the nurses and this is one of my favorite people in the world. She lived um, 100 years, she's in the middle and um, her name is Pete uh, Dryden uh, or Irma Pete Dryden. And she was trained as a nurse in Harlem Hospital in New York. And um, her first assignment that she had a choice of a few assignments where she could go, but it had to be a place on, you know, it had to be a part of the segregated military. And so when she found out that one of her options was Tuskegee and there would be African-American pilots there and she was what, maybe 22 years old. So she decided, yes, she would go to Tuskegee and she did. And on the very first night she was there, she was tired. She'd been on the train all day from New York to Alabama and <clears throat> decided to go to sleep. And uh, the 99th was shipping out, going overseas. A, a unit of the Tuskegee Airmen were shipping out to go overseas that next morning. And so they were giving them a party that night. And so she said, told her commanding officer, no, I don't think I'm going to go to the party. And her commanding officer said, oh, you're in the army now. You will do as you are told. And so she got up, got dressed, went to the party and there she met her husband. And there he is um, standing next to her, Charles Dryden, who is another one of my dear friends as well. And um, they wrote letters back and forth because remember I told you how powerful and, and um, awaited and anticipated the letters were. So they wrote letters back and forth while he was overseas. And then when he returned, they got married. But she was one of my best, best friends. I gave her her 100th birthday party and she's very, very, very missed. Um, the Tuskegee Airmen, a lot of them went on to do amazing work. And these are just um, four examples. And I interviewed all four of these men. Um, Percy Heath um, from the uh, Modern Jazz Quartet lived in... Uh, uh, New York, and Clifton Wharton from, uh, it was also in New York, um, Dr. Roscoe, oh, you know what, all four of these were in New York, that's very much, I didn't even realize that until just now, but I interviewed all four of them in New York, um, very uh, accomplished men, and um, one thing about this job that I did from 2000 to 2005, traveling around the country interviewing the Tuskegee Airmen, even if you weren't a part of the Tuskegee Airmen experience, and even if you didn't become Malcolm X's lawyer or the Assistant Secretary of State, you had a story to tell. Just being born in 1920s, in the 1920s in this country, because you saw the depression, you saw the civil rights movement, and then you saw, um, you know, affirmative action movement, you saw so much and you experienced so much. Um, whether you were in the North or the South, there was also segregation in the North and, you know, being in the North wasn't necessarily, um, as Langston Hughes would say, a crystal stair. That wasn't a crystal stair living living in, in, the, in the North. So, um, but it was, you know, out of the 250 people that I interviewed, these were some of the uh, most memorable based on uh, what they were able to do after their Tuskegee Airmen experience. So I want to say thank you um, for your interest in the Tuskegee Airmen. These are just some of my favorite pictures of them, some vintage photographs of them. And I appreciate your willingness and your interest in keeping this history alive because until lions have their own historians, Tales of the hunt shall always glorify the hunter. And that's an African proverb. And it speaks to the importance of us telling our own histories. 
So at this time, I will take questions. Okay, we have one question to start off with. Thank you so much. That was really interesting to listen to. And I, I really, I liked the quizzes and the being able to interact a little bit. Um, so our first question is Dr. Clifton Wharton, the same man who was president of Michigan State University? Yes, it is the same person. And he had done so much in his life. And I really should have put that on there as president of Michigan State asked him, I, um, I will never forget this question. I asked him, out of all of the experiences that you have had, which experience has been uh, the most important to you? And he said, marrying my wife. And it was just, I just thought that was beautiful. I thought he was going to say, you know, speak to some of his academic or professional accomplishments, but that wasn't it. Marriage was the most important to him. Okay, then I have a sort of a general question too, and it has to do with the, the desegregation or um, of, of the military in the 1940s. We interviewed um, about five years ago, several um, men who had served in, they were all African-American men. Um, they'd served in various, um, uh, you know, service uh, units and none of them in, um, you know, like, they were all, they all served at a time when supposedly, um, you know, during the Korean War, the, there was, the military had been desegregated. Most of them said that was really on paper only, you know, they still experienced a lot of um, problems and just things from like having to be the last in line to buy bus tickets and getting, they didn't get the jobs that they wanted. So did serving in a unit like the Tuskegee Airmen, how did, how did those men how were they treated differently amongst the military while they were serving? Like, did it take time for those changes to kind of happen? Um, did they get better respect, um, you know, the respect that they deserved at the time? Um, or what, what have, who did anybody, did, could they compare their experience with like other African-Americans who were serving in, in you know, um, mixed racial units? Just some comment on that. Okay, yeah, that's a very good question. So what that what happened was after the de the military was desegregated, those who stayed in the military ended up in bases all over the country, really all over the world. And what they experienced was in general being the only one. So they were shipped all over the world and they would be the only African American perhaps on the base. And in some ways, you know, they, they had different experiences. I recall some of them saying how difficult it was, how isolating it felt. And then others saying, you know, it was, it was okay. You know, we were treated as, um, you know, as officers or we were treated as um, enlisted people. Um, and it, so it, it really varied, but, um, but it was hard to be the only one. And out of all of the pilots from the Tuskegee Airmen, 992 men finished pilot training at Tuskegee. Now, not all of them wanted to be commercial pilots, but for all of those who were commercial pilots, I mean, all of those who applied for commercial pilot training, only one of them was accepted. Um, so it was, it, you know, the, uh, even though they had some excellent um, experience, but yeah, they did talk about being, uh, how kind of isolating it was being the only one once they were, shipped off to several bases around the world. And um, now that I mentioned that, I'm gonna, I didn't, there's so much to talk about, but I didn't uh, mention the prisoner of war experience. I interviewed three prisoners of war who had vastly different experiences, um, but they all, but what they agreed on was that they were treated like officers and very different from being in the United States where they're treated like second-class citizens, even though they were officers. But the three men who um, served, uh, who were captured as prisoners of war, always felt respected by the, quote, enemy in, uh, in Germany. One of them um, spent the entire, his entire time uh, behind enemy lines, 
scavenging for food every day because there was it was so um, they didn't feed them. And so he lost a massive amount of weight over. He was, he was um, a prisoner of war for about nine months. Um, so he talked about just being star, you know, living in basically a starvation lifestyle. And this was black and white prisoners. It wasn't just him because he was black. Um, another man had gotten injured and spent his time in a hospital and was treated very well by the Germans in the hospital. They gave him every uh, medical treatment that they could to try to save his leg, which they did. Um, and then the other man talked about, he had a, 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 fat, a wonderful experience behind enemy lines. So I don't know, I don't even know which one really to believe, but what they have in common is that they felt human and they felt like officers behind enemy lines more than they did um, when they were serving in the United States. Okay, um, so there's a, a comment here. Um, the Tuskegee Airmen have an amazing history and certainly World War II might've had a very different outcome without them. So I can imagine. Um, and then a question that's um, sort of related to that. Um, did those uh, airmen that you interviewed realize their role in history? Um, most of them say they did. So um, we have to remember that they were 18, 19, 20 years old. In the beginning of the Tuskegee Airmen experience, everyone had to be a college graduate. And so that would make them 21, 22, uh, around that age. And then um, a few years into the experience, they changed the requirement to, to, ha to having two years of college. So that let in maybe a, um, some even younger men, maybe 19 year olds or 18 or 19 year olds. And so um, they said, we didn't know we were making history. And the reason why a lot of them chose to go into pilot training. So the draft, during World War II, they had a draft. And so if they got drafted, they might end up in the Navy. And nobody wanted to go to the Navy as a black man because your only options were cleaning up and cooking. That was it. So there was basically no opportunity for you to be an officer in the Navy. So they didn't want to go to the Navy. So they said, well, if I'm about to get drafted, if I volunteer, maybe I'll get a chance to go into pilot training. But if I'm drafted, they could stick me in the Navy, which is a place nobody wanted to be. And so that's why um, a lot of them chose. And especially if they had some college, they didn't want to spend their military career. They had to do three years. So they don't want to spend their military career, um, you know, cleaning up a ship. And so that's why a lot of them volunteered. Yeah, I know we interviewed somebody in Niles who um, that that's he ended up serving in the Navy. And he talked about how he was an Eagle Scout. And um, I think he had I can't remember if he had any college at all, but, you know, certainly he was a high school graduate and he wanted more. And. He was a he cleaned up. He was a cook. Occasional lifeguarding. He said he got to do, and I know his experience was not um, fantastic in the Navy. So he was he was happy to come home. Um, another question: um, Were those you interviewed willing to talk about their experience, or were they more reluctant to? Yeah. So the other five historians, I'll have to describe them. So there were. Um, three men and two women. Now, the other men, two of them were white men and in their 30s or so. And then one was an older black man in his 70s, maybe, 60s or 70s. And then there was me, and then there was a white female. So I describe people like that because I didn't get the more gruesome kinds of stories. I think they looked at me as a granddaughter uh, you know, uh, or uh, someone that could be their a uh, person who could be their granddaughter. And so I didn't get the gory kind of stories about war. They just weren't going to tell me, but so much. I think I got a lot of the racial stories, which is what I wanted to hear. Um, and those are stories probably that the whites didn't get. Um, they didn't, they did probably didn't get the racial stories. And the same with the white female may not have gotten the racial 
or the um, the gender kinds of stories. Like we didn't, they never told me about what men did on their after hours or, you know, I didn't, and you know, they weren't going to tell me any of that, probably even if I had asked, which I didn't, but I was interested a lot in um, the cultural kind of aspects of it. When they talked about war and who shot down what, and this, the, the, uh, benefits of the Piper Cub versus the other, you know, honestly, I really didn't have an interest in that, but I acted like I did, so they never knew, but um, my interest was really in some of the cultural aspects, what they experienced as, um, as Black men um, and the women that we interviewed also, and I was also really just, um, I don't know, in awe of men in there who were born in the 1920s who had parents who went to college. So I wanted to know about that experience. So the interviews that we did were whole life interviews. So generally my first question was, tell me about your childhood. Some of them I say, tell me about your childhood. And three hours later, I'm still sitting there and I've only said a handful of words because they just told their whole chronological story and that was fine. Um, but um, but so, so I think I did, get some reluctance um, out of respect for my age, perhaps, and, and my gender, and that was okay. Yeah, I can imagine. It would be interesting to see all those stories put together. So uh, multiple people would interview the same person? Um, no, we, um, no, just in that okay. sense with, um, with Chauncey Spencer, I just interviewed him because I wanted to meet him and I found out, you know, that there was another angle that we could get about him. I just wanted to interview him, but everybody really interview uh, one person would interview one person. Um, and out of the 800 that we did, I guess if we ever did any kind of study on it to see what um, information people were more likely to share based on the race and gender of the interviewer. That actually would be a really interesting study. Um, yeah, but but um, no, everybody just interviewed one person. There was one person, Span Watson, who I interviewed four times. Span Watson was a, um, went overseas as a, as a Tuskegee Airman pilot. And he did such an amazing interview the first time. I said, oh, this is a good one. And he would call me and say, forgot to tell you uh, about the time I punched out the mayor of Walterboro. I said, okay, Mr. Watson, I'll be back in New York such and such a day. I'm going to come back to your house. So I would go and interview him again. And then he would call me and, you know, another few months later and say, you know, I don't think I told you about so-and-so. So actually I ended up interviewing him four times, but, and I think that was the most anyone had got, ever gotten interviewed. And it's not because he didn't be forgot to tell me or I forgot well maybe I did forget to ask, but he had so much experience and so much um so much to tell and he was such a good storyteller that I didn't mind going back to interview him four times but um but there were some who were like that that were just so absolutely engaging um that you just want to sit and you don't really want the interview to end and he was one of those Nice. Dr. So. Dr. Bratton. Yes. Did you did you talk to these men at all about what how they were received when they came back to the States after their service? Where you know, where you, you said that they were pretty much treated with integrity and, and you know, as professionals. How was their treatment when they came back home? Yeah, that's a very good question. So they were treated as humans and as officers when they were overseas. When they come back to the United States, their thinking is that, you know, I sacrificed, we sacrificed our time and our, you know, some of us were killed and some of us were injured and we've been over here three years, maybe longer. And so when we get back to the United States, it's going to be different because they will appreciate all of our sacrifices. Okay, now, when that troop ship Negroes this way, white people this way. And they really just felt, I don't really know if I can even put it into words, just felt betrayed by your country because of all that you did. Some of them missed their babies being born. 
They miss, uh, you know, just make all these sacrifices and then get off the ship whites this way and colored this way. So um, that was a very, uh, a, a painful part of it for them. The other painful piece of it for them was they were um, on the base here. And they were on a base here in the United States. The German prisoners of war, who were the enemy, right? They could go into the white officers clubs and they had basically had the run of the base and they're the enemy. While the black soldier, the black officers had to um, have their leisure time in a segregated officers club. So the white officers club had a pool and um, speaking of, of uh, Freeman Field, a particular army base in Freeman Field, Indiana. Um, the white officers club had a, had a pool and it had, I think a tennis court, it had all these amenities and then the Black Officers Club was just kind of a room with a pool table and it didn't have a lot of the amenities. But the white German prisoners of war, the enemy, they could go to the White Officers Club and go to the pool and all of that. And the Blacks could not. So that was a, uh, uh, when they told that story, when they talked about that, that brought so many of them to tears. That was just, I, I, I've never been in the military, so I can't really feel it the way they did. I have been discriminated against. So I can feel it in that way. But when you are making the so much of a sacrifice and then you see the enemy being able to do what you can't do, I'm sure it's very heartbreaking. Um, yeah, I'm sure. Very demoralizing. Absolutely. That's a, that's a perfect word. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great question. There, there's a comment from, we do have a, a little watch party going on at the library in the basement. And somebody um, made a comment that um, the airmen never lost a bomber that they escorted. Okay, <laughs> controversy. So I have to explain about a bomber. So a bomber plane has 10 men inside and um, a bomber is big and it's heavy and it doesn't go very fast. And so the, um, and you have to think too about the scope of war. When I started this work in 2000, I have no concept of war. And so I'm thinking that it's one bomber and 10 airmen surrounding the bomb, 10 fighter pilots surrounding the bomber, but it's not that. It's, it could be dozens of bomber planes going to a target. And so the since the bomber is slow, and heavy and has 10 men inside of it, the fighter pilots fight, you know, um, fend off the, uh, protect the bombers by shooting at the enemy to keep the bomber plane from being hit. And so um, the, the Tuskegee Airmen, it is said for a long time that the Tuskegee Airmen never lost a bomber. Um, in the black, that was their, job of the airmen, the Tuskegee Airmen was to protect the bombers. That's their job. Now, it was also the job of white fighter pilots. Remember, we have two militaries. So it was also the job of the white fighter pilots to protect their bombers, but they didn't always protect their bombers. They want to be war heroes. So they're going out here and here and here and here and trying to get kills and trying to, you know, become an ace, which means you got five kills in one day or something like that. So, um, but the, the um, commander of the Tuskegee Airmen said, do not leave the bombers, period. If you leave the bombers, don't come back. Don't come home somewhere else. And so this was Bill Davis Jr., who you saw a picture of earlier. So they stayed with their bombers. Now, I traveled all over the country with the Tuskegee Airmen different times. Even, I still work with them. So I've been with them for 20 years. So. Um, I've traveled with them a lot. Every single time we go anywhere to an air show or in anywhere in the country or to any event, 100% of the time, a white man, young white man comes up to them and says, thank you for your service. My great, -grand my grandfather was in World War II. He was a bomber pilot. 
and you protected him. And because of you, I'm here. And then if they have a child with them, they say, little Johnny, this man is important. And then they want to take pictures with the airmen and all that. So we, they, the, the white bombers were very, very appreciative. And I, like I said, I, I've seen it so many times. As a matter of fact, once um, there were two airmen and another woman my age, and we went to, a, to an event in New York with two of the Tuskegee Airmen. And so four people gave up their first class seats. They gave them up for the airmen and then two people gave them up for us, which of course I never would have expected. I understand giving up your first class seats for the airmen, I get that. But then two other people got up and said, no, you're with them, you take our seats too. And they came and sat in coach. So we get that all the time, people paying for their meals, et cetera. And people, uh, you know, um, whites, sons of, and daughters, of the bomber pilots really understand that um, the Tuskegee Airmen stayed with the bombers. Now, the controversy is as to whether or not they lost the bomber. And there's a historian in uh, Maryland who spent a lot of time going through a lot of records to prove that the Tuskegee Airmen lost the bomber. And so I think he found that they lost one or two, maybe three. But the, 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 the reality is they have a, 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 a world a, a record that has not been beat before or since in terms of protecting bombers, which is really important. So, you know, if it's been one, two or three, it's still way less than any other unit in the military. Hey, um, along with that, there's a sort of a related question um, there. And then that's, that may be, you know, what the, our last question for the evening. Did any of the participants you interviewed recount the reactions of their descendants upon learning of their participation? Did they understand the gravity of their service? No, a lot of times, no. So what we would do, we would um, record the interview and then send it off to a professional transcriber. And then the transcriber, and then we would get it. And then I would kind of edit behind the transcriber. And then I mail it out physically. This isn't, you know, before everybody did everything virtually, but I would mail it out physically to the airmen and they can have a chance to go over it. So a lot of times their children were the editors of it and say, oh, well, let me, I'll look through it for my dad or for my mom. And so many of them said, you know, my father never talked about this. My father told you information that he has never, ever shared with us. I don't know how many times I heard that. And, um, and wives, so, some wives shared, that, shared the same. And I think it was because, um, I don't know, maybe no one asked or no professional person asked. Maybe that was it. And um, it could be that they were older. When we interviewed the airmen, they were late 70s and into their 80s some. And, um, you know, it's a, and it's um, with the federal government. This is a National Park Service that did these interviews. And so maybe it was that, but I'm not sure. I, I, but I had so many people, children and wives say, my father, never, my husband never talked about this, never. And so, um, yeah, and maybe because I'm a stranger, you know, you may never see me again. So, um, yeah, but they, they do talk about that. And even now, now, unfortunately, the stories are not available to the public, which I think is the biggest travesty. Um, I fought for years um, when they built the airman site for them to add a place where people could come and listen to the stories. And so, you know, the internet was a little bit new and they didn't want to put them, the government didn't want to put them on the internet because they said people can alter them. Okay, well, they can, but I mean, and yeah, it's it's been a fight. And in some ways I've left the park service in 2005, but that's still a battle that I sometimes fight um, with them to make these stories available. I mean, the technology is there to send these stories around the world, um, but they're not available to the public, which I think is a shame. Yeah, it sure would be great to hear some of them. So just hearing stories of the interviews, which are really interesting to listen to, but you need to hear their stories. Um, one little final comment here. My husband is here with me. He's the Dwajak 
area uh, history museum director, and he reminded me that um, they have a, a Tuskegee Airman, uh, Richard Harrison was his name. And he, uh, his grandson, he works with his grandson and has interviewed him um, about that service. And he's looking at me now, so I'm, I'm looking for confirmation, but. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, well, you should interview his grandson. I'm, I'm telling my husband now that he needs to get that. So, um, but they do, they, they are, um, you know, around us. And um, do you, one last, I could ask questions all night, but I, I, I just have one. Um, I think we'll be quick. How many Tuskegee Airmen are left um, still living? Yeah, that's a good, good question. So now um, I've been going to a lot of 100 birthday parties on Zoom. And the youngest person who went into, uh, Mr. Archer lived here in Atlanta, was um, uh, went into the service at 14, did a little doctoring of his birth certificate, and he went into the army at 14. He has passed away, and he's probably the youngest, uh, one of the youngest Tuskegee Airmen. Um, so now there are really a, a small handful. Um, I don't want to guess because I only... Um, no, mostly the ones who were involved with the national organization. So if they weren't involved with the national organization, I don't really know them post-interview. I'll take a guess, and this is a guess, don't hold me to this, 20, and that's a guess. And that's probably a pretty high guess um, because I'm thinking of the ones that I know who I've talked to recently. One, two, three, four. There's five that I, four or five that I can think of off the top of my head. So that's why I say, you know, maybe 20, because everybody's turning 100 now. Well, thank you for helping to keep this history alive. So, and I know um, some people are naming some more in the comments now, um, local people that we have. Um, so it's, it was really great to hear all of this. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Bratton. I think we all enjoyed um, hearing this history and I know um, we'll get a, a count of participants. Like I said, there was a group at the library because we are starting to do a little bit of in-person things, but it was really great to have you join us virtually tonight. And um, there's lots of um, thanks in the comments and um, compliments, great, great program. So thanks again for being with us. Um, good night, Hi. everybody. And thank you. This was a pleasure. I enjoyed this. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for coming.